Um, the first thing that, that they've discovered is that the process through which antlers grow is really a, a form of bone cancer, which is really cool because, you know, nothing can grow as fast as, as, as antlers and cancer, right? I mean, those two are very fast-growing things, and it's amazing that a whitetail can, can put on this much bone in, you know, 100 days or so. Um, and so to do that, they have to do a couple of things. Uh, one, they have to kind of sort of turn on this, this form of controlled bone cancer, and they're the only mammal that can turn it on and turn it off, which is pretty cool. The other thing they do, which is unique to, to, to cervids, is they go through a form of controlled osteoporosis. Uh, there's not enough minerals in their diet during the antler growth period for them to grow the size antlers they need uh, through their what they can take in nutritionally-wise. So they have to rob their skeletal systems. So they, they rob their skeletal systems for these nutrients to grow these antlers, and then they repair themselves. No other mammal can do that. Uh, so if we can, from a human science standpoint, it's really cool. Uh, because if we could, you know, learn how to start and stop a cancer and start and stop osteoporosis, that's some pretty cool stuff for us. Um, the other two wow factors about uh, antlers, um, before I kind of pitch it to Carl and let him start talking about some of the different causes of, of antler deformities, various things, is that this connection that exists between what I'll call a, a hardened antler, not, not the growing one, but the dead, this is basically dead bone at this stage, this connection that exists with the pedicle the stump on the skull is the only known uh, connection between a dead tissue and a live tissue. And you think, how in the world can an animal keep a dead piece of bone on their body? And it's through a very complex little structure called haversion canals, right? <laughs> um, and, and, and think of those as these little straw structures, right? And straws that are holding the antler to the head uh, during the, um, the normal time which deer will carry their antlers, they're filled with, I'll just call it a jello-like substance, right? And you can imagine that a straw filled with something is stronger than a straw that's not, okay? So what happens is when testosterone levels start to decline after the breeding season and after winter in most parts of the whitetail's range, those, the, the material in those straws gets basically sucked out and the straws get brittle. And that's what allows that antler to break off and fall to the ground. Uh, that's called the abscissin layer. Um, and there's something called osteoclasts that form at that, at that, at that point. But it's a very unique process. Um, and the other wow factor to me is that the, the velvet that covers the antler during the growth period is really analogous to human skin in a lot of ways. Uh, very cool. But the one difference is that it's the only known skin-like substance that we're aware of that can consistently heal with no scarring. So no matter how many times you cut an antler, it grows with zero scarring. Okay. Human tissue doesn't do that. We scar. So, in fact, in China right now, they're using some of the, uh, the, the, the science behind velvet antler to work with burn victims to try to repair, you know, human you know, <clears throat> injuries. And that could be a great advancement in our science, right, if we can repair our, our wounds. And I've got many. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, that without scarring would be great. Um, so, you know, a lot of really cool stuff out there on antlers. Um, before we kind of get into, you know, age, nutrition, and genetics, I think that's probably the next next step i think there's some things we can expand a little bit on uh, what you're talking about is we really don't know at this point how antlers actually originated <laughs> what caused this structure we know how it's done but you know what actually triggered it back in you know in prehistory but antlers are formed by uh the structure a, a, a group of cells called the the periosteum that's located on the deer's forehead and both males and females have it so d females do have the ability to grow an antler uh, but it's not triggered because that periosteum is, is triggered by testosterone in that buck's first spring. There's a little surge of testosterone that causes that periosteum to start to grow, and it connect, makes a connection with the frontal bone and causes the formation of the, the little buttons on, you know, on that buck's first antlers. And, uh, and that periosteum is located, in, like I said, on the forehead patch on the, you know, of the deer. But what's really intriguing is there's researchers that have found that you can take that periosteum and attach it to other parts of the deer and actually get a bone, an antler, to grow on other parts of the deer. And it will go through the same process of growth and shedding. And they actually have used it and have transported it onto nude mice as well and grown antlers off nude mice as ever because of that, that structure there. Yeah, it's, back to Carl, it was really cool, this, the research he was quoting that were, they transferred the, the, uh, the antler growth tissue, if you will, from 
the skull and pedicle region to different parts of the body. They, backs and legs were some of the areas that they've tested. And to see a little antler growing off the side of a deer's leg is a pretty cool thing. Uh, it goes through the velvet stage. You know, it goes through everything. It's not a big antler. Doesn't, you know, we're not seeing something like this growing on the side of their, their body. But one thing that's really cool there is that this, um, this tissue isn't only, uh, doesn't only reside on the pedicle. Okay, so a lot of times you'll see an, a deer with an, an accessory antler coming off the forehead. Okay, it's because that tissue is laying there normally dormant. Okay, not doing anything under trauma, uh, under probably some conditions we don't know. It can, it can basically sprout an accessory antler off that because that tissue isn't just on the pedicle. A lot of people think that's the only place that an antler can grow. It's not exactly the case. So, I'm, you know, I mentioned that does have that same material there as well. But they don't get the testosterone trigger unless there's something physically, physiologically unusual about them. And that's why sometimes we may get an antler doe or sometimes an injury might start, cause that to start to grow. And you can get an antler doe. Now, an antler doe is not going to go through the cycle, yearly cycle like a buck is because she doesn't go through the, the changes in testosterone. But she can grow an antler that would be, you know, it would be a permanent, it wouldn't be a deciduous antler. Right. Same as the same, almost similar situation to, to a velvet buck, right? When we talk about velvet bucks, we're talking about bucks during the normal hard antler season that are still in velvet. Okay. Number of reasons can cause that, but the underlying factor in all of those is they have insufficient testosterone levels to finish the, the mineralization and velvet shedding and casting process. So they can grow an antler just fine. Okay, so they can grow an antler in the absence of, of substantial testosterone, but the problem is without that spike that we get about this exact time of the year, we're talking about, you know, almost September 1st. In fact, I had my first bucks uh, shedding velvet on our property yesterday and the day before. So my first couple of bucks are shedding as we speak, shedding their velvet. They've had this spike of testosterone. Um, so without that, they can't finish 